Saturday was silent, surely it was through. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment is Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? This is the sound of a dry bones out of land. This is the sound of the dead man's walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out and I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bones out of land. Cost of fire, stirring something new. You're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon. Resurrection powers runs in my veins too. And I believe there's another miracle here in this room. I said, This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. I couldn't tell if that was me or if that was the electric guitar. No, it was you. It was me? Okay. I don't know if there was like feedback. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, good morning. My name is Kevin Johnson. I'm the pastor here at Hope United Methodist Church. And we are very glad that you are with us in worship this morning. Um, whether there's feedback from my microphone or the guitar is getting excited, we're glad that you're with us in worship this morning. Um, you might have noticed a giant truck outside. Um, that was just for you this morning. Um, big, exciting things happening. No, we have our uh, pumpkins here and starting to be unloaded. Um, uh, I made a deal with them that they could continue unloading um, as long as it's not too distracting. So when I start preaching later on, if that side of the room uh, hears beep, 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 and it's too much, let me know, and we'll tell them to stop it. Um, they said if they start doing it now, um, that we cannot be unloading until nine o'clock. Also, the more they do now, the less we have to do. Um, so I have an extra long sermon this morning. Um, we're excited about that. No, we're, uh, so anyway, uh, we're, we're glad to be in worship this morning. We're excited to unload pumpkins uh, at the end of the service. Um, so please stick around. Uh, hopefully you might have brought a change of clothes or not. 
um, that's cool. Just wear your Sunday best to unload pumpkins. Um, uh, all right, I don't know how to get out of this. So um, anyway, so let's go ahead and do, yeah, Pastor Appreciation Month. Um, let's go ahead and do our mission and vision statement. At Hope, we commit to you connecting with God, each other, and our community while becoming mature followers of Jesus Christ. Together we will experience God and share the love of Jesus. Let us pray. Gracious God, we know that you are in all places at all times, and we have no business inviting you into the sanctuary because you have been here long before us. But God, we do invite your presence to fall down upon us. We invite you into our spirit. Help us to breathe your spirit in and breathe out all that would distract us. Help us to breathe in your goodness and your mercy, to breathe in your forgiveness and your love, and to breathe out all the concerns of the day. God, help us that we might be fully present to worship you. Amen. Would you go ahead and turn and greet one another this morning?
with glory now The Savior knelt to wash our feet Now at His feet we bow The one who wore our sin and shame Now robed in majesty The radiant For all to see Your name, your name is victory All praise will rise to Christ our King Your name, your name is victory The fear that held us now gives way to Him who is our peace. His final breath upon the cross is now alive in me. Your name, your name is victory. Spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit, I will Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Lord Jesus, we just lift up our hearts and our minds to you today. You are that life giver from when we're, you physically give us life in our mother's womb. But Lord, you also give us life each and every day by sending us that Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. You use us to project your will to the world. Help us to hear your message today and to feel your presence, Lord. We lift this up to you to give you all glory and honor and praise. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship in song. Worthy of every 
every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Holy, there is none beside you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me With your heart and lead me In your love to those around me Worthy of every song we could ever sing we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other As we transition into a time of prayer, uh, before we get there, I'm going to do a little bit of a rant. Um, I wish I had a soapbox to stand on, but I don't. So um, so we are going into uh, uh, the holiday season. Um, it starts with the most holy holiday, um, and that is Halloween. Um, and then it seems like there's just holiday after holiday until we get to Christmas and New Year's. And so, um, but there's something about Halloween that is able to capture um, the magic of the season and uh, kids still enjoy it. You know, we, we hear in our society often that, that kids grow up too fast. 
And I agree with that. Uh, and part of it, I think, is that we as parents force them to grow up a little too fast. Um, and Halloween is one of those times that even uh, high school kids still like to participate in the fun. Um, and so my bit of a rant this morning is to let them this Halloween season, if you have high schoolers that are at your house, whether they are dressed up or not, um, whether, whatever, whether you think they're too old to trick or treat or not, just give them candy and be nice to them. Um, if you want more candy, let me know and I can buy you candy to give out to them. Um, and and, I, and I'm, I'm serious about this. Like, we get mad when our kids grow up too fast, but then in a lot of ways, we don't let them be kids. Um, and, and don't worry, I also have the same rant for teenagers. Like, don't let me down. I'm advocating for you. Like, don't mess up the pumpkins or decorations on your way away from their house. Like, just be cool. Um, and hopefully, as the seasons go on and we get to the actual holy ones of Christmas that kids are able to maintain that magic, still be kids and enjoy their time. Uh, so we have a number of volunteer opportunities coming up and I'll talk about uh, a lot of those later on in the service, but um, let's, let's find ways that we can uh, encourage our kids to still be kids. Uh, this has nothing to do with uh, one of my kids going to homecoming last night and seeing them grow up, and now my car is covered in um, sparkly glitter, and they get to clean that later on. This is about Halloween and letting kids still be kids. Um, this morning, we definitely still need to be in prayer uh, for Southwest Florida, the uh, Fort Myers and um, surrounding areas. Uh, w one of the ways that, that we notice responses happen is that there's an immediate large response, and then over time it kind of falls off. And we know that the recovery of this will be going on for a while, um, and we're going to continue to respond as a church. We're going to continue to uh, be in prayer for them. Uh, we have a, 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 a bucket challenge that we're going to be participating in. I know that it went out in the weekly email, uh, and also um, uh, we'll talk about it this morning. Battle of the Buckets. There's another uh, church. Uh, I think it is Riviera UMC. Uh, my friend Augie, a pastor over in the St. Pete area, we're going to have a little friendly competition and see which church loves Jesus more. I mean, can um, pack more buckets. Uh, we, have a, um, we have a list of those items, and so if you want to buy a bucket and then go out and buy all of the stuff to fill it with, um, or go in with another couple or a Sunday school class or a Bible study or whatever, um, they're about $75 a piece. Um, or if you would like to just give a monetary donation, we're going to put our Wink kids, our Wednesday night kids, um, and our, high school ref our middle school and high school kids, our refuge Sunday night we're going to put them to work, and, and they're going to be um, packing some of these buckets for us. Uh, this is a way that we can be an answer to someone's prayer. It's a big part of my theology. They, my thought and speech about God and things related to God is that I believe that we are oftentimes an answer to someone else's prayer. God uses us to answer someone else's prayer. And so uh, whether it's the battle of the buckets uh, whether it's responding in any other way, we get to answer someone's prayer. Uh, this Tuesday and Wednesday, um, I will be going down to uh, Pine Island uh, with another uh, pastor over in Clearwater uh, at Heritage UMC. Uh, pastor Matt Haran and I um, and some others are going to be going down via boat uh, to deliver some things and to see what's going on. Uh, one of my good friends, Kaylee, is a pastor at Pine Island UMC. Uh, and so I'm excited to see her and um, see what's going on. Uh, I, I think seeing it in person will help me to um, to help me to uh, see what's happening, uh, help me to understand the need a little bit better. Um, I know there are many other things going on in the life of the church and around the world that we can be in prayer for. Uh, so let us join our hearts and minds together. 
Gracious God, as we come to this, your altar, remind us of your goodness and your mercy. Remind us of the times that you do choose to use us to be an answer to someone else's prayer. Remind us that your scriptures tell us time and time again of faithful followers of you, how they pour out their love to this world. God, we know we live in a broken and messed up world and that your will is not for this world to stay the way it is. We don't understand all the ways that you move in and through us, but God, help us to realize that you do choose us. Remind us that our walk with you should be a contact sport. That our life lived out in response to your goodness is more than what we do for an hour on Sunday morning. It should be manifest in all that we do. God, help us to be your kingdom builders and your peacemakers. Remind us that your sacred scriptures do not end with all of us dying and going to heaven, but rather with heaven coming back to earth. Help us to take serious the prayer that we say each week, that we would bring your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, that we would actively work to bring about the kingdom God, we pray that you would embolden us and equip us and enable us to go into the parts of this world that are not very heavenly and that we might actively work to bring your presence there. So God, we humbly offer this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So when I was in uh, seminary, I was working full-time. Uh, I was a, a parent and a spouse full-time, and I went to school full-time. Uh, we, when I started seminary, we had two kids, and when I finished seminary, we had th five kids. Uh, so we had three in the process of me going to seminary. Uh, and, and because of that, I didn't have much leftover time. Uh, I, if you've ever gotten a master's degree, you know that you spend your entire life reading. Um, and so I was just always reading and then writing some things and doing all the other stuff. And so long story medium, I missed out on a lot of TV shows. I missed out on a lot of TV shows. And that and I also, we've never had cable in our marriage. Um, other than when we lived in Hollywood and it came with the parsonage, uh, we didn't use it, but that's the only time we've ever had cable. Uh, we've also never had a landline, and we've never had the newspaper delivered to us. We're just a weird family. Now, I, and so I missed out on a lot of TV shows. And over the years, I, I, had a, I have a note on my phone, and I would put in uh, shows to watch. Uh, and now that there's streaming services everywhere, I can binge these shows, and, uh, and it's wonderful. Um, and I have a list of, uh, it's now down to 20. It was 21, but I started a new one, and so it's down to 20. And whenever it's time to start a new show, I, I go to Google, and I random generate, and I put in, like, numbers 1 through 21 and hit random, and it tells me a number, and then I count down the list, and that's the one that I start next. Yeah, I'm weird. I know. And there's one on there that I've never gotten to watch yet, and I can't wait till I do. And it's a very holy and very reverent TV show called The Walking Dead. <laughs> I, I really want to watch it, and I haven't been able to yet because the random numbers on uh, Google haven't told me that I can. Uh, but, but I want to watch this because spooky things are fun for me. I, I like spooky things. I like jumping out and scaring people. Um, I grew up in a weird family where we hid in closets and bathtubs and other things, and we jumped out and scared them, and I realized early on that Annette didn't, and that I should not do that. Um, I forgot it last night, but um, 
And that got called to a birth and did some things. And then when she got home, I was awake. And I waited until she got, like, completely ready for bed. She gets in. She lays down and turns off her phone. And then I made a really weird noise and scared her because I am a child. And I thought it was funny. <laughs> and I forgot that she didn't and that I love her. But anyway, so <laughs> enough therapy from the stage. Um, so The Walking Dead, it's a, it's a TV show about zombies. And what better month to do a sermon series on zombies than the spooky month? <laughs> so we're not just doing a sermon series on zombies. We're doing a sermon series on there's four times in the Gospels that Jesus goes to a funeral. There's four times that Jesus goes to a funeral, and spoiler alert, he raises people from the dead. And when I was younger and I, and I heard about Jesus raising people from the dead, I thought that he made zombies, which was cool to a young kid that wanted to know more about Jesus. And it was also weird, like Lazarus getting, I thought it was, anyway. So, Jesus doesn't make zombies, sorry. But Jesus goes to funerals and messed up things happen. And so this series, we're looking at a number of stories about Jesus going to funerals and not creating zombies, but raising people from the dead. We're going to start off this week with probably the least known story about Jesus going to a funeral and raising somebody from the dead. And don't worry, I forgot about it too. And I have a master's degree in this stuff. And so don't worry that you might not have ever heard this story or you might have forgotten about it. It's a, it's a lesser known story, but it comes to us out of the Gospel of Luke. Um, and it's a story about Jesus visiting a funeral. And when we read in the Gospel of Luke, um, we have to remember a couple things about Luke. First of all is that Luke was a historian. Luke loved history. Luke was not one of the disciples. He was a Gentile, and so we, we, we get a different kind of emphasis in, in what, he, what he tells us. And because he's, in a, he's a historian, you th would think that locating the story in history would be important for him, but we don't get any names of the people. We don't get the name of, of the family members. We don't get the name of the kid that dies. Uh, spoiler alert, it's a story about a widow whose only son passed away. To so a widow whose only son passed away, but we don't know their names. And I always wonder why that doesn't happen. I always wonder why we don't get some names. Um, and another thing is that uh, because Luke was a historian, Luke makes reference to things in history. Uh, Elijah is a prophet. You might have heard of him. Uh, Elijah is a prophet in the Old Testament, and he's, he's kind of a big one. They really like Elijah at Passover. They have the Elijah. They, they, they wait for him to come back. Elijah is important. So keep Elijah in your mind as we walk our way through this. Um, I'm also going to be preaching in a bit of a different way. Uh, I'm going to be um, what's called walking through the scripture. So I'm not going to read all of it and then preach. I'm going to read a little bit of it and then preach and read a little more and preach. And so um, a little bit different this morning than what you might be used to. Um, the story that we read this morning parallels the story of Elijah raising somebody from the dead. There's a story that where Elijah did that. And so uh, we're, we're going to be kind of paralleling these, um, juxtapositioning them against one another. So you need to remember that Elijah raised someone from the dead. And the story comes right after Jesus healed a servant of a Roman soldier. So Jesus has healed someone, and then we get this story. Uh, verse 11, Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to a village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him there. All right, so the village of Nain. We all remember what Nain is, right? Nain is less than a day's walk from Nazareth. Nain is, is also just on the other side of the hill of Mora. No? Nobody? Okay. Okay, so we all know what the hill of Mora separates from Nazareth, right? Really? Come on, y'all. Okay, so there's Nazareth, and then there's the Hill of Morah, and on the other side of the Hill of Morah is 
Nobody? OK. All right. So I, I can tell by the blank looks on your face that you might have forgotten what it is. So on the other side of that is the town of Shunem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Shunem, right? We all remember Shunem. My goodness. OK, so Shunem is the town where Elijah raised somebody from the dead. OK. So we have this town where Elijah raised somebody from the dead. We have a hill separating it. And on the other side, that's where we are. So this area would have remembered what happened just on the other side of the hill. This area would have remembered through stories, through conversations, through campfires, through preaching, through all. This area would have remembered. That's a big deal that you remember what happened right there. Okay? So don't worry. Remember, I didn't know it either. So, okay. So everybody knew what was going on. Word of Elijah, word of what Elijah had done would have definitely spread through that area with significant to all the inhabitants. Everyone would have known about Elijah. And I want you to keep that in your mind as we continue working our way through this scripture. All right, picking up in verse 12. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. So a funeral procession uh, came out of the gates, and that's important. Because in the Old Testament, in the, the first five books, the law, that you're not allowed to bury somebody in the city gates. It has to be on the outside. And so the funeral procession is coming out of the gates. That means that they're about to bury the person. That also means that they're coming out of the gates which means that they're not in the city, which means the funeral procession has already gone all the way through the city. When they had a funeral, they would do a big procession through the city, and depending on how important you were, it might weave its way through everywhere, and if you were not that important, then kind of took the short route to get out there, okay? So a funeral procession, they come out of the gates, and that's when uh, Jesus and his disciples stumble upon them. They were close to the burial site. The mourning had been going on for quite some time, and I, and I have to wonder if the widow, if the mom, was growing quite numb to the pain of loss of her only son. As a pastor, I've had the privilege of uh, participating in many different funerals, and I say privilege in, in all honesty because it's one of the most holy things that I do as a pastor, walking through that process with a family. And one of the things that I tell families is don't let anybody tell you how you should mourn. And so I'll tell you all this, don't let anybody tell you how you should mourn. There is no should when it comes to mourning. There is no you should talk at the service. Or there's no you shouldn't say anything at the service. Now I get it, well-meaning people like to pass on the experiences they had. I didn't talk at my so-and-so's funeral, and it, and it has bothered me to this day. So you, no matter what, you have to go up there. You should say something. Well, you can't tell somebody how to grieve. Laughter often happens at funerals. And one thing I've noticed is that the day of the funeral, towards the end of it, I, you know, I'm talking to people, and I can tell that they're just numb. They have mourned themselves enough for that day. And sometimes people feel bad. Yeah, I haven't cried yet, Pastor. I don't know what's wrong with me. What's wrong with you is that you've been doing stuff. You've been keeping busy this whole time, and you haven't given yourself a chance to mourn yet. And so just wait until you go home. And grief comes in waves. There's no should about it. So I wonder if the mother was feeling a bit numb. She had been mourning, and, and they're going out, and she's coming out of the gates. I wonder how she's feeling. And then continuing in verse 12. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. So the, being the, the only son, uh, we, we, have to, um, we have to unpack this a little bit. Because that is the same thing, a widow's only son was the same thing that Elijah did just on the other side of the hill. So that would have brought up some memories for the original hearers of this. They knew that area. They knew what was going on. And, and, and so, okay, maybe there's some parallels here with Elijah. It also means that a widow's only son had passed away. Um, she, was, she was not going to be very well taken care of in the future. 
That's a special word for, for the, um, the original hearers would have understood that this, this line about only son was how Elijah was. This, this line about only son was also Jesus. There's a lot of parallels going on here. But this woman was also probably going to be destitute because she was a widow, so she didn't have a husband. Her only son had passed away, and in those days, only men were allowed to hold property or anything. And so there was question of what was going to happen with her. What was going to happen with her? She didn't have a, any person in her life that was going to help her. She was going to be on the street. I'll let you fill in the blanks of what that could mean. She could be a beggar. She could have other jobs. Continuing in verse 13. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. When he saw her, her his heart overflowed with compassion. Just think about that for a moment. Jesus' heart, the Lord's heart, God's heart overflowed with compassion. God incarnate, heart overflowed with compassion. Jesus knew what it meant for her, knew that she was destitute, knew that she didn't have any support, knew that her only source of income and support was gone. Jesus knew that the death of her son meant her life was in shambles. Where do you know that she dealt with the death of her husband because she was a widow and now her only son was gone and so her future was unsure. You see, in that time, women had no way of supporting themselves. I, I know that I'm belaboring this point, but I, w we don't get it as much as they do, as much as they did. And then Scripture tells us that Jesus' heart overwhelmed with compassion. Other translations say that Jesus' heart broke for her. Then he went over to her. Jesus went over and interrupted her life. And sometimes Jesus does that to us. Sometimes Jesus interrupts our lives, and this time he interrupted a funeral. And I do mean interrupted. He was not invited. He was not a long-lost relative that made it there just in time. He was a nobody. So Jesus goes over to speak to her. What's he going to say? What kind of words of comfort is he going to offer? What kind of words of compassion? What kind of words of love? Let's read about it in verse 13. So Jesus goes over to her. His heart is filled, overflowed with compassion. And he says to her, don't cry. What? Don't cry? I'm a widow. My only son has died. I've done this whole funeral procession, which we'll get to in a moment. I'm outside of the city. We're about to bury him. And you tell me, don't cry? Are you kidding me? We also have to understand that, that don't cry, it's absurd, because there were professional mourners. Professional, people got hired to weep and wail at a funeral, which is useful. We might want to bring them back, because guys like me who were raised and told that, no, you don't have emotions, you have to just like bury it down deep, and now we're broken and can't cry? We pay people to do that for us. And so they had professional mourners. And depending on how wealthy you were and how important the person was, they had different levels of mourning. And so maybe on the, on, on the low end, you have somebody that just occasionally just deeply sighs for you. You know, every couple of minutes. And then on the high end, you have somebody that screams. So like every house, they scream and wail because they're a professional mourner. They take this serious. And so in the midst of this, Jesus goes over and tells this woman, who we know all of what this means for her, don't cry. It's so bizarre. Now, we get, we get the benefit of knowing the rest of the story. We get the benefit of knowing who Jesus was. We get all of that. But they had no idea who he was. We sometimes miss the absurdity of Scripture, but we need to hold on to that this morning. Don't cry. Imagine telling that to somebody who just lost their only child. Don't cry. Imagine telling that to someone whose life has fallen apart. Don't cry. 
I can assure you that that got her attention, and I wonder, if we're honest, I wonder what kind of horrible thoughts she had towards him. Or, as I said earlier, was she too numb? Was she too numb at that point? I also need to point out here that another reason of how strange it is to say don't cry is that we, we read in verse 12 that a large crowd was with her. A large crowd was with her, and he goes up, interrupts the funeral procession in front of all of these people and says, don't cry. This is so weird. Let's see what happens next. Verse 14 tells us what happens next. Then Jesus walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearer stopped. He walked over to the coffin, touched it. Those that are bearing the coffin stopped, and he says, young man, I tell you to get up. Okay, again, we need to figure out the absurdity here. This is such a weird story for the people that heard it, and much less the people that experienced it the first time, because this was not a coffin that we think of. This was an old school coffin. This was a stretcher. And again, depending on wealth, it could have been made of wood or reeds. It could have just been cloth. It could have had poles or not. And Jesus interrupts this funeral, goes over, touches it, and tells the person to get up. Also, you don't touch a dead body. In Jewish culture, you don't touch a dead body because then you're ritually unclean and you have to go through this like multiple day process of a cleansing ritual. All the good Jews, even the bad Jews knew that. That's another reason why the story of the Good Samaritan That's one of the excuses that we give for the the priest and the Levite who come up first and they see this person bloody and bruised off to the side and they can say, well, he was on death's door and if I were to help him and it wasn't going to work, then I would have to cleanse myself. It's not a good excuse, but it's an excuse. And so Jesus, being a rabbi, knew better than to touch a dead body the funeral procession, it's going out. He goes up and says, stop crying. Let me go over and touch a dead body and tell it not to, or, and then tell the dead body to get up. All right? Put it in modern context. You're at a graveside service. The pastor is about to be finished. The body's about to be lowered in, and then some wet behind the ears, young pastor right out of seminary comes walking up, interrupts, says, stop crying, and then goes over to the coffin and says, hey, get up. That is how weird this is. And add all of the cultural understanding of not touching a dead body and what that would mean, and, and, and you can't do that. We sometimes forget that Jesus was a no-name rabbi with a band of rejects for followers, and in this story, he stumbles upon a funeral. He wasn't looking for it, just stumbled upon it. This rabbi interrupts the funeral, telling the grieving mother to stop crying, goes to touch the dead body, makes himself unclean, and tells the body to get up. How crazy did he look? Not only saying this probably made the mother angry, but they were also useless telling the body to get up. When people are dead, they don't just get up. But let's see what happens next. Verse 15. Then the dead boy sat up. And began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Jesus gave him back to his mother. It worked. Jesus was able to raise this boy from the dead. And not even in the creepy zombie waking dead kind of way. No, in the Jesus waking the dead kind of way. It wasn't useless. It wasn't mean. It was the most compassionate thing that Jesus could do. Could you imagine being one of the Paul Bears? Could you imagine being one of the people carrying the body and this person comes over and tells the dead body to get up and then all of a sudden it does? If that was me, they would have been lucky that I didn't drop it and run away screaming. But the important thing here to notice is that Jesus took the sadness of the mother and turned it into celebration. I've I've definitely already belabored a number of times uh, the point of just how, how destitute this woman was now. And Jesus sees the sadness and turns it into celebration. 
He not only sees her present sadness, but also her future sadness as well. And he, he took that sadness and turned it into celebration. The scripture says, he gave him back to his mother. Remember where we are in the, I can't even remember all the words, the hill of Shunem and the hill of Morah and the town of Shunem. In 1 Kings 17, 23, we read, Then Elijah brought the boy down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. In this story, Jesus gave him back to his mother. Jesus restored this relationship. But Jesus gave her back something else. Jesus gave her back that future that she lost. Now, this was an oral culture. They, they knew these stories, and so I am sure that Jesus used those same words. I'm sure that Luke used the same words of giving back the son to his mother. Verse 16 ends with, They were filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. It's no wonder what the similarities that we've talked about between Elijah and, and, and what happened on the other side of the hill and what Jesus did here today, that the people would naturally choose the word prophet to describe Jesus. It's an echo from the Old Testament expression, God has come to help his people, we find in Ruth one six. When Jesus shows up to a funeral, weird and messed up things happen. Jesus is able to turn the sadness of this woman into celebration. And we saw today that sometimes Jesus interrupts our lives. I wonder when the last time Jesus interrupted your life. In just a few chapters, we read in, in Luke chapter 9, and Jesus will give us these words. And he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. I've talked often in this uh, service about a daily death to self. A daily death to self where you lay down at night and you ask God to help you cast off those things that are holding you back. What are those things you want to leave dead in the grave? And then you wake up in the morning and put on the new things for that day. A daily death to self, getting rid of the things that prevent you from being what God wants you to be. Getting rid of the things that prevent God using you to be an answer to someone else's prayer. I wonder if God needs to interrupt your life. Now, we, we love interruptions in our lives as a way of making a new beginning. My, my kids have told me that as much as they don't like me being a pastor and moving around all the time, one of the things they do like about it is that it gives them a chance to start over. It gives them a chance to start over. You know, at my last school, I was kind of a brat. Maybe at this school, I won't be as much. You know, in our last neighborhood, I was really mean to that kid. I think I'm going to be nice to kids at this new school. You know, that last place, I, I always did this, but, you know, maybe I'm going to start doing that. We, we use things in our lives often of, like, moving to new jobs or new places or starting over. We forget that we can do it every day. We forget that we can have a daily death to self. We forget that we can begin again. I've, I've told you about that, that uh, blogger that I really like that says that he starts a diet Tuesday at lunch. And we all know the story. You start a diet Monday morning, you do great for breakfast, you do great at lunch, and then Monday afternoon you absentmindedly pick up an M&M. And that one M&M you pop in your mouth, you're like, ah, oh, that one M&M has ruined my entire week. And we do the mature thing and say, oh, it was one M&M and I'm going to move on. No! We're like, well, there goes my day. I'm going to have the rest of these M&Ms. Let me take the whole bowl back to my desk. And then go crazy for dinner and crazy for dessert. And then, well, I, got, I mean, who's going to start on a Tuesday morning? That would just be weird. So I got to wait till next Monday. But this daily death to self, this Jesus interrupting our lives, this beginning again, this starting fresh, it can happen anytime. It can happen anywhere. It can happen. 
So I wonder where we need Jesus to interrupt our lives. I wonder where Jesus needs to come in and interrupt our imperfect life. So during this next song, during this next bit of worship this morning, I want you to think about that question. Where does God need to interrupt your life? Let us pray. Gracious God, I pray that you would interrupt our lives. I pray that in the midst of our sadness, in the midst of whatever is going on, that you would just abruptly interrupt it. Remind us of your goodness and mercy. Remind us of your call on our lives to be your image bearers. God, where there is sadness that you can turn into celebration, we ask that you would help us. God, help us to put aside our expectations and rather to lean on your knowledge. We pray that you might interrupt all that is happening, all that is pulling us away from you. God, that we might seek after you. Amen.
Lord, we lift up these gifts to you. Use them for your service. Amen. And now if everyone would please stand as we sing our closing song. Wake. It's a new one from earlier. We heard it once, so now we get to try it again. One, two, three, four. give the benediction uh this side of the room stack your chairs oh, wait, no, oh no no, no. no just joking this no, side no. of the room go do pumpkins and this one too uh, so <laughs> all right uh, receive now this benediction may the grace of god the father almighty the friendship of jesus christ the son and the power of the holy spirit be with you now and always amen